So I'd like to welcome everyone to our first installment of the Women of Wonder Sharing Her Story. I am Tiana Ellington, direct, Assistant Director of Chapter and Regional Programming for the Alumni Association of Case Western Reserve University. Now, more than ever, you may be seeking community or closeness with whom you have something in common. Um, and I'm hopeful that we are able to provide that for you today. Before I turn over the program to our speakers this evening, I wanted to invite everyone to participate in a poll. The poll should be popping up on your screen now. So while you complete that poll, I just wanna let you know a little bit more about the Alumni Association. We strive to bring valuable programming through our platforms to connect you with each other and back to the university. We host programs and provide resources to more than 115,000 alumni globally, and our wish is for you to stay connected with CWRU. Thank you for taking part in this poll. Spoiler alert, there will be an additional poll later on this evening. Our programming is being recorded and it'll be available on our website and social media channels for access at later dates. Everyone is muted by default, and we do this so there is no background noise and that our featured speakers can be better focused on and the question at hand can be heard. We would appreciate it if you could turn on your video so that everyone could participate today. The Alumni Association is sponsoring this special series with our partners at the Flora Stone Mather Center for Women. And with that, I would like to welcome the director of the center, Dr. Angela Clark Taylor. Thank you so much, Deanna. I am, Dr. like she said, I'm Dr. Angela Clark Taylor. Sorry, since the, the poll popped back up in front of my notes on the screen. Um, and I'm so excited to be here with you all tonight. The Women of Wonder program started in 2018 and continues today as a collaboration between the Florida Mather Center for Women and the Alumni Association. We strive in this program to showcase and celebrate the achievements of esteemed alumna um, like Justice Stewart and connecting alumni around common interests, hoping to elevate professional development opportunities for all of our alumna. To that end, I just wanted to share a little bit about why our, our goals of connecting across the Alumni Association and the Florida Stone Mather Center for Women, um, particularly why this year our first ever Women of Wonder Sharing Her Story uh, series during Women's History Month. We're excited to feature leaders, innovators, and champions, and to preserve the history, or the herstory, the living herstory, uh, here at Case Western Reserve University. These programs help to highlight the new strategic plan of the Mather Center, which focuses on, on similar aspects, uh, particularly leading, empowering, and innovating. Um, how we both celebrate women doing that and help in the future. Um, and so without further, thank you for joining us and turn it over to our moderator, uh, Assistant Dean Andrea Porter of Student Services and Clinical Instructor at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. Dean Porter earned her Master's of Social Science Administration from the Mandel School and is a member of the Academy of Certified Social Workers and an Ohio licensed independent social worker. She has extensive experience in public child welfare practice and has also performed work in crisis intervention, individual and family counseling, program development and evalu uh, evaluation, and child advocacy. Please welcome Dean Porter. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark Taylor. It is a pleasure to serve as moderator for this installment. We are so fortunate to have with us today Case Western Reserve University's alumna, Justice Melody Stewart. Justice Stewart was elected in 2018 as the 161st Justice and first African-American woman elected to serve on the Supreme Court of Ohio. She served on the 8th District Court of Appeals for 12 years, including service as the court administrative judge in 2013. Her previous work includes positions at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, University of Toledo College of Law, Ursuline College, and a staff position at Case Western Reserve University. She graduated with her PhD as a Mandel Leadership Fellow from the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel 
School of Applied Social Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Justice Melody Stewart. Thank you, Dean Porter, for the introduction. Uh, thanks to Dr. Clark Taylor and Ms. Ellington, the university, all who worked to put this, this program together tonight. It's an honor to be uh, part of your speaker series. Thank you. Justice Stewart, thank you for joining us as we debut this special series of For Women's History Month. It's an honor to have you. I have some questions for you. And if our audience has any questions, please post them in the chat. We will try to get to some of your questions uh, once I ask the, my initial questions. So let's get started. So Justice Stewart, can you share with us your background and how it has culminated to the Ohio Supreme Court? Well, um, I am a, a, a local gal through and through. Um, I was born and raised in Cleveland. Um, ironically, literally uh, around the corner from the campus of Case Western Reserve. Um, I was born in, in the University Hospital, um, grew up in the Huff area of Cleveland initially, and then later in East Cleveland. I was raised in a, in a single mother home, and my, my mother um, was born and raised in the segregated South when schools for African-American children only went up to the eighth grade. So although my mother was not formally educated, um, I didn't know till going through some of her things after she passed that she uh, got her GED when I was a junior in college, when she was in her 60s. Um, but I would have never known that because she was so well read and my mother acted at Caramu Theater um, in the 40s and 50s before I was born. She wrote poetry and, and she, she instilled in me an appreciation for, for education and learning and, and for the arts. And so, um, but I was not one of those kids who knew what she wanted to be when she grew up. Um, but I just, I got exposed to a lot of things. I, I started studying music again around the corner from Case Western Reserve or in University Circle at the Cleveland Music School Settlement, where I studied music theory and, and classical piano and classical guitar. Um, went to school locally, a law school after getting a music degree at the College Conservatory of Music at the University of Cincinnati. And when, was, when I was on the campaign trail and people would be surprised that I was a music major in college, I would have to tell them with a name like Melody, what else was I going to study in college, right? You know, so, um, but that's the only thing I wanted to study. And what, how would I know later that that would help me in one of my many careers as a lawyer? I was an assistant dean for admissions and financial aid for a law school. And so many people would call and say, you know, should I study political science? Should I be a government major? You know, should I do a double history? And I said, you should major in whatever you enjoy so that your grades are good. You just need to have a bachelor's degree in something and have a good LSAT score. And so, and then when I would tell them I was a music major, sometimes you would just see this sigh of relief come over them thinking that they had to study something in particular. Um, and then after being a lawyer for 12 years, by sheer coincidence, and I mean by sheer coincidence, I discovered the doctoral program at the Mandel School. Um, when I was there to visit someone at the school to talk about running for judge in, in, in Cuyahoga County, and uh, the, the assistant to the doctoral program there at the time was a woman I met who told me about this Mandel leadership program to do a PhD there. And I can remember thinking to myself, is she crazy? Does she know I'm a lawyer? I've been a lawyer 12 years. Does she know I have no intentions of going back to school? You know, famous last words. So that, that in a nutshell, um, that kind of gives you a, a capsule view of, of my time there. And I'll, I'll end that, this sentence by saying, I, um, I, my kindergarten teacher, I went to Charles Orr Elementary School, which is on 101st. I don't believe that's the name of it now. It might be a charter school. It's right behind those new 
apartments at the corner of Huff and 101st or something. And mm -hmm. that's when I first started school. And my kindergarten teacher there lived off Wade Park, 115th and Wade Park. She and her husband lived there all of their lives, actually, until they passed. And when I did my doctoral program at, at Case, I saw them walking one day and stayed in touch with them. She and her husband came to my doctoral dissertation defense at MSAS. So that was a full circle moment for me to have my kindergarten teacher be at my doctoral dissertation defense. Nice. I like that. I like that story. What impact do you hope your work will have on empowering women and advancing gender equity? Well, well uh, you know, every day I think I that's that's always in your mind, right? It's it's just it's part of of uh, who I am and who I think a lot of women are in the work that they do. Now, I have to say, we've made a lot of strides in gender equity in the legal profession. Um, there was a point in time where fifty percent of uh, women in law school or, or students in law school were women. And um, when we look at the judiciary, although Ohio judiciary is still primarily male, I believe something like, oh, probably 70 to 75 percent male across the state. In Cuyahoga County, it's about 66, 67 to 70 percent women in the judiciary in this county. I mean, there's some counties in, say, Ohio, where all the judges are white and all the judges are male. But in, in your more urban communities, there are, there's more diversity on the bench. So I think we've made strides in that regard. Um, but, you know, there's still always the tendency, I don't care what your position is or how much education you have, there are gonna be people who want to, quote, put you back in your place whatever mm -hmm. that means to them. And so um, I do, I still experience that. I mean, we can look at our chief justice of the Ohio Supreme Court, who is a woman, who is the first woman to be in the chief justice position and the only woman, obviously, so far. Um, and even then, you still see that because she is a woman, even though a strong woman, um, there's still that, that tendency to want to, I think, in society have women, and particularly women of color, um, be in a place or, or be somewhere, be put somewhere where you feel, when, the, when you feel that they are somewhere they should not be. Okay. Next question. What role has your community played throughout your professional and personal life? And adding to that, who are or were your support systems and mentors during this journey? Oh, well, well th those, those are way too many people to, to, to talk about. But really, I've had them at every phase of my life. Some are known and know who they are, and some are unknown, quite frankly. Um, you know, again, I had my mother, I was born when my mother was older. My mother was, was turning 40 when I was born. And so I think I got the benefit of being raised by a wise woman who had a good support network with her friends, even though my mother is one of 11 children, but she's the only one who lived here. And so she was very close to her siblings, but we would have to travel to see them. So she had friends here. We had friends who were like family to us, uh, who were, you know, my aunts and uncles, uh, my play aunts and uncles and cousins. So fortunately, uh, and I grew up in a time in, in Cleveland when, when there was more of a community. I mean, you did something wrong and the neighbors saw it. They had already called ahead to your mother. So by the time you got home, you know, they had scolded you, your mother scolded you, and it was, it was just a more sense of the community. Flash forward to my education. You know, I talked about my kindergarten teacher being my dissertation defense. She was a person who said to my mother, while I, when I was six years old, she, she encouraged my mother to enroll me at the Cleveland Music School Settlement because back then in the Cleveland Public Schools, we still had a, I had a piano in our classroom and my teacher played. And when the kids went outside to play, I would go over and tinker at the piano and see if I could play the songs she played. 
So she encouraged my mother to 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 um, get me piano lessons and to to learn music. And then just teachers I had on in the walk of life. I later went to Catholic schools. Um, the Ursuline community has been very supportive to me. I went to Beaumont, um, and that's where I probably got the bug put in me to run for anything. I was approached by the Dean of Girls there to run for student council president. It was a time where more students of color were coming into um, Beaumont School. And, um, and uh, so she asked I run for vice president of the school. And I took that information back to my mother and, and I, she said, well, are you gonna do it? And I said, I need to give it some thought. Uh, I hadn't run for anything except the bus to get to school on time. And um, I, my mother asked me the next morning, you're gonna do it? And I said, no, I don't think so. And she said, oh, honey, I'm disappointed. And I said, I'm gonna do one better. I'm gonna run for student council president. And so I became Beaumont's first black student council president. Maybe that was a foreshadow of things to come. But again, the sisters, the, the religious community or some communities were supportive of me, the law school, the, the least amount of support I probably got was in undergraduate school. I was in Cincinnati at a time when there were high racial tensions there. I mean, you know, the Ku Klux Klan burned, burned, burned uh, uh, crosses outside. They recruited on our campus. It was, uh, but I knew I was at a good school and I was going to learn in spite of that. And then as I became a, 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 a law student and a young lawyer, I watched what people did. And so some people who had bad habits, you watch those too, so that you learn what not to do and how not to treat people. So it, it literally, literally at every aspect of my life, there were people who, who, um, I, who mentored me directly or indirectly. Okay, so how do you hope your story will be told? And if the film version were being made today, which actress would you like to see play you and why? Film version of my life? Oh. Yes. Um, um, I, I would hope my story would be of a little girl who was raised in a loving home by a single mother who worked very hard to afford me as many opportunities as possible to learn, to grow, to be creative, and in an environment that was as safe as possible and as nurturing as possible, uh, despite her own limitations with education and with, with finances. And my mother worked for the post office. And I can recall each time the neighborhood began to get a little seedy, you know, my mother would start looking for a place to move. There were just things that she, she sheltered me from to try to keep me from being exposed to. Um, as a teenager, um, I hope I'd be portrayed as, as a, a young person who recognized and appreciated and understood the efforts and sacrifices that you know, my mother made um, and was not gonna let those go to waste because she worked too hard for them and for me. And as a young woman who grew and matured into somebody who is uh, a responsible and caring person, and then who would go on in life to attract, to attract like-minded, like-hearted people into her life, all to, to accomplish a greater good. Now, as to who would play me, <laughs> that's uh, I, there's so many actresses for whom I have a great deal of respect for their work. I'm a great respecter, if you will, of good work, period. I mean, and, and, and anything, everything, garbage collecting, mm -hmm. wait staff, neurosurgeon, judge, lawyer, teacher. Um, you know, I'm always praising, you know, my, my nieces and nephews. Obviously. A job well done is a job well done. So for who would play me, I would just hope it'd be a great uh uh, someone who's good at their craft, a great actress, and maybe, you know, not someone who's already known or, or famous, maybe a little known actor or somebody who's making his or her, de uh, her debut into acting. I guess it could be a him if they just, the makeup was good, or, but someone who is breaking into to action for the first time and, and maybe someone for whom um, you know, it would be a breakout performance playing me or something. And, and that helps, you know, keep the pipeline, pipeline of talent coming through. Okay. 
So what are your thoughts on reforming the justice system? <laughs> you got about six hours for tonight. Um, that's a that's a, a a conversation that's probably way too lengthy for this, but but just let me say this. Um, we need to get out of our minds that there are a group of people who are throwaways. Nobody is a throwaway. I don't care what you've done. And some crimes are absolutely heinous without question. And they deserve um, punishment. Some people need to be taken out of our society to protect others. And our system of corrections or rehabilitation is supposed to do that. We're supposed to protect the public and punish the offender. But those people are not throwaway people. I don't think they should lose, they lose their liberties, but I don't think they should lose their rights as citizens. So for instance, I think people who are incarcerated should be able to vote. And in some states, they can. Um, and so um, we need to, are we going to rehabilitate people? Or are we gonna just simply punish them? We need to make some concerted effort, decide, do one or the other, but don't pretend that we're in a rehabilitative or correction process when we really punish as much as we can, as hard as we can. And keep in mind that we, we are always, um, it's easier to punish people who we don't, we can't relate to. It's easier to punish people who we think are not like us. And, and I mean that in different ways, whether it's economically, whether it's racially, whether it's ethnically, whether it's by way of education or some socioeconomic status. Um, I think we need to have more procedures in place that limit individual discretion. Um, two of the main categories in the justice system for that kind of discretion is law enforcement, police officers, and trial court judges. Not to be confused with appellate court judges or Supreme Court justices like I do, but trial court judges. Law enforcement, officers can arrest you, put you under arrest, even if the arrest doesn't stand up later, or if you, you know, um, get out on, on bail or bond, they have to make a decision on whether they think you've committed a crime. And once they make that decision, they're entitled and, and indeed um, authority to arrest you. And once that action goes into place, so many bad things can happen from that, as we've seen. It could lead to severe bodily harm, for the citizen or the police officer. It can lead in death for the citizen or the police officer. And assuming that we get past those, we have somebody who's incarcerated who may not be able to make bond or bail. Remember, ours is a system of innocent until proven guilty. Yet if you can't make a monetary bond, then you sit in jail until your hearing comes up. That can cause you to lose your job, that can cause you to lose your housing, that can cause you to lose your family, your benefits. So that we need to, to, to put measures in place to, to try to, I think, ward against all the, as many potential dangers as possible with individual discretion making. And we will have a tendency too to be, to let our personal offenses get in the way. Take for instance, a trial court judge who is sentencing a defendant who then gets angry, lashes out at the judge, you know, is disrespectful, calls the judge, you know, bad names or curse him or her out. Um, you know, what should happen in that instance? Should the judge, if the judge gets angry, and it's not a good decision on the defendant's part, obviously, but if the judge, if the judge gets angry, can the judge give that person more time in jail? Is that lawful? You know, those are the sort of things. So if we put things in place, to help uh, at least guide that instruction. We're in the process of the Supreme Court of trying to put a database together to make sure there's fairness in, in sentencing so that somebody that perpetrates a crime in, in Hardin County, Ohio, uh, doesn't get a sentence that's way disproportionately different from someone who gets sentenced for the same crime in Cuyahoga County. Um, and even I think we need to look at our policing efforts are we familiar with the Elijah McLean case, the young man in Colorado who was killed when police officers put him in a ch ch chokehold and he was later administered ketamine and died at the hospital. So here's a young man who was on the autism spectrum who went to the store, got some goods and was on his way back home. Should have been no problem. Someone called the police and reported somebody suspicious looking. 
Now, what does that mean? So the police roll up on him and they try to stop him and he's trying to get home. And he says, why are you stopping me? I'm going home. And the officer's response was, because you're being suspicious. Is there anything identifiable? He was only suspicious for walking home with a bag and maybe, maybe being a young man of color. In my mind, there should be some protocol in that police system that says, when someone calls and says there's someone suspicious, they need to, dis to, to describe what that suspicious activity is. Is it someone that's trying car doors along the street? Is it someone looking into people's apartments? Is it somebody stopping passengers by as they go by? But walking from a store to, a, to your home is not suspicious. And if you can't identify that activity, in my mind, the police officer should not even send a policeman to that area because now you're putting a citizen in interaction with a police officer that could result in unnecessary harm to either the citizen or to the police officer. So those are just some of the things, you know, I think. And then last but not least, we do have to educate our community. You know, this is not a one-sided proposition. You know, we talk about blue lives and black lives mattering. They both matter. And keep in mind, some blue lives are black lives too. And maybe we need to do a better job in our community of saying, this is the type of behavior that you should, this is how you should conduct yourself. If a police officer comes up on you, one, you're likely to get home safe. And two, even if you have done something wrong or done some infraction, you at least get the opportunity to have a police officer discretion of giving you a warning or something of that nature. So this is a this is a conversation that needs to take place. And we need to recognize, I think, all aspects of it and, and, and not point as many fingers as, as we've been doing and not saying that one side is a polar opposite of the other. Okay, thank I'm you. Sorry, that was a little long-winded, but as I said, that's okay. <laughs> you got you got your point across. Uh, you've worked in a variety of roles prior to becoming a justice. How have these past positions shaped you for the role you have now? Yeah, one of my nieces was looking at my resume once and said, "What, I man? You can't keep a job." Um, <laughs> I said, I like to think I'm well-rounded. Thank you very much. Uh, I, you know, all of my positions, everything, you, you learn as much as you can from where you are. Being in legal academia, most of my law career was in, in, in law school academia, either being a law professor or being an administrator. And, and because of that, the intellectual aspect of, of, of law um, always just always kept me learning and wanting to know more. And I was very fortunate that when I did the doctoral program at Case at the Mandel School, I was fortunate enough to do every single assignment and paper on a subject that was social welfare law related, be it uh, elder care, be it juvenile, um, be it juvenile um, delinquency, uh, so those are things, so it, it, that helped, and, and doing the doctoral program, even though I never thought I'd go back to school, helped me be a better judge, and I defended my dissertation while already a judge. I started running for the Court of Appeals um, in the middle of my coursework at, at, the, at the Mandel School, and had to run three times before I got to the Court of Appeals, so then by the time I got there, um, I was defending my dissertation. But that program helped me to ask the right questions when I'm on the bench. So for those of you who don't know, in our judiciary, we have trial court judges, which most of you are familiar with, you see on TV, with juries and witnesses and testimony and objections and drama. You know, that's, that's I've never been a trial court judge. So my work has always been at the appeals level, which is an intellectual discussion with the lawyers about a case. And then we get to write opinions. So, so in a lot of ways, appellate court judging is a lot like being a law professor in that we research and we write and we, we write opinions that are authored. So long after I'm gone, um, hopefully there will be some decisions that I've written that live on and that help to shape our, shape our community. And I'm always keenly aware about that when, when I'm writing, but I also practice law. And so that helps too in, in my job. So I just always say, I don't care what you're doing learn something from that experience and take it 
as a tool to use for, for the next position, regardless of what it is. Okay, as the first African-American woman elected to the state's premier bench, what, if any, pressure do you feel? Hmm. <clears throat> well, I, got, I have to tell you, I don't feel any real pressure. Um, I, I figured that by the time I, I got to the Supreme Court, um, I should be in full dress rehearsal on, on what it is to, like to be a professional and to be a member of the judiciary and to do my job. Um, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm scrutinized more, I don't know. But the one thing I will tell you is I do feel a sense of responsibility to make sure that there are doors open to those who have not had the opportunity to either work at the Supreme Court or to uh, who feel that they wouldn't stand any chance. If you feel if there are some women or particularly people of color who feel like they have a greater chance of, of either getting to the court as a justice or as working at the court in some administrative capacity or being um, uh, law clerks um, at, at currently at the Supreme Court. I don't think we have a single solitary African-American law clerk for any justice. Um, I had one who went to a law firm a couple months ago, but, but there might be the thought that, you know, I don't stand a chance because nobody there looks like me. Well, now somebody does. And, and so it's, I do feel that there's responsibility to, to make sure doors are open and to make sure people know that doors are open for opportunities to be there and to not eliminate yourself um, early on. And then of course, I also feel as I always have a uh, responsibility to be accessible and available as much as possible. I am a public servant, I am an elected official. And so I think part of my job when I'm not in a robe and on the bench, is to um, be that, that sort of public servant for whatever community um, needs me to be that for them. Okay, so let me see if we have any question. Uh, we have one question in the chat. Um, what is the difficulty in selected jurors more representative of the defendants? The difficulties in selecting juries more representative of the defendants. Keep in mind, the jury system um, assumes that the jury is composed of your peers because the jury is not made up of other judges or other defendants or other people who've been, you know, who are incarcerated. So they're supposed to be your peers, regardless of their geographic, I'm sorry, regardless of their demographics. Um, so, but in reality, if some, if a poor man of color has a jury of, of all females, none of whom are the same ethnicity as he is and come from communities that he does not come from, is that a jury of his peers? So I think, you know, there are certain laws in, in, in place, some United States Supreme Court decisions that try to help ward against that. But to be completely honest with you, and I don't know that there are too many trial court judges would disagree, there is still a sense by defense lawyers and prosecutors that um, people of like-minded or like look will have a tendency to be sympathetic toward someone who looks like them or who doesn't look like them, whether it's the victim or whether it's the defendant. And so what part of the problem about that is you know who the jury is, is pulled from. The jury is pulled from people who vote. So if you're not a registered voter, you'll never serve, you'll never be called to serve jury duty. And, and that's another motivating factor for people to register to vote. You can't complain about the jury system not being representative of you if there's a large block of your community who won't register to vote so that they can even get called. Um. One, another question is how much will it cost, uh, does it cost, or is it is required to run for re-election? Statewide? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I have to tell you, um, I, without question in 2018, I raised less money than any and all statewide candidates 
for any office of any party. And, and I knew that would be the case. I was the only African-American female running statewide um, in the 2018 general election. So um, what, to, what said to my team, we have to work harder, we have to work smarter, and we have to use our resources better. Um, I, prob I may have even raised more money after I got elected, um, and that's a whole other story, but um, it, it's, it, it's a daunting, it's a daunting amount of money to raise, and you can only get your message out um, as much as you can most of the time with the funds raised. Now, granted, for me, I think the blessing for me is I had so many people who spread the word about my candidacy or forwarded some things via social media. When I first ran for judge back in 2000, um, there was no such thing as social media. We went down to the board of elections. We got a list of registered people. We did literature and put stamps on them and put mailers on them and sent them out. But now in the advent of, of Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram and some of those things weren't even around when I ran before, it has, it has helped even the playing field a lot. Um, um, there are people who have raised over a million dollars and run for statewide election and not one. You know, the, the flat answer generally is we want about a million dollars to run for a statewide office. I believe in 2018, by the time the election came around, I had raised less than about $240,000. There were people in local races who were in county races who raised much more money than I raised. And so um, it's always our, our philosophy is you want to raise as much as you can be as frugal with what you raise and do what you don't get in resources you try to make up for um, in effort. So it, it depends. So, so there are people who raise over a million dollars, uh, 1.5, 1.7 million dollars and lost their elections in 2018. I raised about 240,000 by the time of election and won mine. So it's, it's, it's not an exact science. Well, uh, Justice Stewart, I'm sorry to say we're nearing the end of this interview, and I have one last question for you. What advice would you give to our audience when it comes to staying motivated and bringing about change? Oh, we have to stay motivated. <clears throat> it's, if, if now doesn't tell you, if the times we're going through now doesn't, doesn't reflect that, doesn't show you that, I don't know what will. Um, because if we don't stay motivated, then apathy wins and going backwards wins and um, voter suppression efforts in and equality ends and, and um, um, opportunities for all in. And, and so, again, and none of us has to do it by his or herself. Collectively, we're powerful. And, and so I hope that uh, not only do we continue to stay motivated, that we get re-energized. You know, it's warm today. We'll, we'll get, you know, days will be longer. Um, we, we spring forward this weekend. We start spring next weekend. People will be clamoring to get out. Once we get herd immunity and we feel we're all safe again, we'll hug again, we'll go out. And, but we still have to stay vigilant on helping to make our part of the world a better place. And if we don't do that, then our remaining years won't be great. And then look at what we'll do and what we'll leave behind for the generations to follow. So not only do we have to do our part, we have to motivate each other to do our part. This has been uh, very enlightening, and I want to thank you again, Just Justice Stewart, for spending time with us today and sharing your story. Um, and I was hoping that this didn't end, but we do have to do that. Um, so I'd like to turn this over, the program back over to our host from the alumni office, Tiana Ellington. Yeah. Thank you, Dean Porter, very much for that. Um, and thank you, Justice Stewart, for um, joining us this evening. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I wanted to realize that my video was getting dark. <laughs> oh, no. 
Well, it's that time of night. <laughs> I wasn't looking at myself. <laughs> um, I would also like to drop in the second poll that I mentioned earlier today, if you could just take a moment to answer that. Um, and I'd also like to mention, if you are not a member of the Women of Wonder group on the CWRU Connect platform, which is a digital platform um, from the Alumni Association, I would like to encourage you to join um, not only the platform, but the community. Um, and you'll be able to continue the conversation um, from this evening, as well as join future conversations in the Women of Wonder uh, realm as well. So I'm going to be adding that to the, pl uh, to the chat as well as my contact information and the contact information for Angela Clark Taylor for the Flora Women, uh, Flora Stone Mather Women's Center. Um, if you want to get more information or contact uh, us further for, in for anything else. Um, our next installment of the series is set for Thursday, March 18th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And our guest will be alumna Carrie Mine Butcher, who is the director of the Lionheart Capital Partners and the founder, president, and CEO of Mind Stencils. Hey, so, Tiana, it's Brad. I'm gonna, I am gonna. said I wasn't going to talk, and I am going to talk. because we. <laughs> you got the old script. It's actually going to be Tuesday, uh, uh, March 16th at 1 p.m. So... Um, Ignore okay. what I said. Tuesday, March 16th at 1 p.m. And you, you can find all the information out. And I'm going to be quiet again and let the women's series continue. No, I appreciate you for that update, Brad. So Tuesday, March 16th at 1 p.m. Ignore what I said previously. Um, but I will be putting the registration link for that event as uh, well as the other events in that uh, herstory series. You can find those here at alumnievents.case.edu slash go slash herstory. Um, and thank everyone for participating in the polls. Um, and thank you for participating with us this evening. I hope that you stay safe and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Bye, everyone. Thank you again for having me. Stay safe. Stuart. Thank you. Be safe.